Good morning. Uh, we, <laughs> my lovely assistant, Dave Kennedy, uh, we, uh, we got a little turned around, so we did the uh, scenic tour of the entire convention exposition fairgrounds. Whatever this place is, we took that tour. But uh, we're grateful to be here. Thank you to Michelle and her staff for getting us all uh, squared away. Uh, a little housekeeping before we start. My name is Dean Moylanen. I am Director of Architectural Services for Noble Company. I have worked with them for 19 years. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and I'll tell you why that might be relevant in a couple of minutes, but hopefully you received a little care package as you walked in here. A um, Couple articles I've written that are very relevant to some of the topics we'll discuss today. I have a menu of my CE presentations. There's also an out, printed outline of this presentation if you want to take some notes and some information about Noble Company, uh, before we start the presentation, uh, Noble Company is uh, a producer of high quality Division 9 waterproof membranes, crack isolation membranes, exterior deck membranes, sound isolation membranes, and linear drains, and a variety of accessories as well. Now, we're going to jump into this presentation here. Uh, that's going to be our first deadly sin. Um, but let me tell you how I arrived at these seven deadly sins. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. There are 160,000 hotel rooms, okay? The most of any city in North America, arguably the most of any city in the world. So what's happened, I've lived there for, for 28 years, working in the ceramic tile natural stone industry. I get almost 20 years with Noble Company, but during that time, there has been fantastic development. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet a lot of architects, uh, contractors, specification writers, forensic failure experts. And so we compiled a list of the seven deadliest sins, things that we see happen over and over again. And uh, some of them are very elementary, rudimentary, and you think by now we would know better, but nonetheless, they continue to happen. So we're going to start with working, working in order of seven up to one. Ignoring the flood test. Now, does everyone here know that flood tests are mandatory? That they are required? When you are doing waterproofing a shower pan, back of the house food prep kitchen, uh, you're doing a health club, if there is tile stone, a drain, water, a membrane, you have to flood test. Now, I will tell you recently, Dave and I were on a project where the contractor, maybe unknowingly, maybe knowingly, was going to put the sheet membrane right over the drain and then flood test with the drain covered by the membrane. Now, does anyone know why that wouldn't be a good idea? Obviously, you're, 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 not, you're not testing one of the most critical parts of the flood test where that membrane you know, when it clamps into your clamping ring drain or your linear drain. That is the number one area of failure, okay? So there's actually an ASTM standard we may have included in that uh, brochure. If you don't, didn't get one, let me know. I'll get one to you. But basically, it's two inches of water for 24 hours. And that's the entire wet area, OK? I mean, I've heard contractors argue, well, we're just going to test right around the drain. Or we're going to test you know, just for an hour, and that should be good enough. Or like Dave and I uh, experienced a couple weeks ago, we're going to flood test, but we're, we're going to cover the drain hole with the membrane. So none of those shortcuts are going to work. Now, this is really analogous to a scenario I went through in Las Vegas. This is a forensic file. Now, if the drain is the number one area of failure, can anyone guess what the number two area of failure in a, where the shower pan meets the wall, OK? You've got a plane transition. You have two different substrates. Uh, you have different rates of movement, deflection, et cetera. And if that detail, and you know, let me see if, I don't know, if, it's probably not going to work, you know, but I'll just, when this detail right here on the opposite side of this image is a shower pan, and it's flashing up the wall. And if you don't have a, if you don't have a product, a finished waterproof membrane that's going to withstand that movement, you're going to have a problem. By the way, as we talk about movement, let me quickly discuss ANSI standards about movement. There's an ANSI standard for movement, 
and to A118.12. Now that's for crack isolation. And I hear folks tell me, wait a second, well, you know, we're talking waterproofing. If you're a contractor or an architect, it's, it would serve you well to make sure your waterproof membrane can withstand movement, okay? Because you can have a fantastic waterproof membrane, but if it can't withstand movement, it's, it's, it's gonna fail. Uh, the uh, standard level of performance, by the way, per ANSI is a 16th of an inch. High performance is eighth of an inch. I would ask you, saw cut joints, cold joints, plane transitions, movement around the drain, do you think that movement might be greater than a 16th of an inch occasionally? What do you think? Yes? I, I agree. So you might do well when you pick out a waterproof membrane, make sure that it meets the ANSI uh, standards, A118.12 for high performance, that's an eighth of an inch. Obviously, you don't want things like this to happen. It's a pretty dramatic result of water collecting for some time on a residential substrate and framing and, and eventually resulting in complete failure. Um, we have seen in commercial applications, when you don't do a flood test and you discover that that shower pan or back of the house area is failing or leaking, your typical remediation costs are five to 10 times the original installation costs. Now, I've, I've, heard, I've heard contractors and owners go, well, we're gonna flood test after we put the tile and stone. We, we're gonna install the tile and stone and then flood test. That makes no sense, folks. That just, that's crazy uh, because when you do find that failure, you're gonna have to tear all that tile, all that stone up. Uh, also, too, I've heard the objection, the room is too big, the area is too large. I'm gonna go back a couple slides here. This is Laguna Honda Hospital. This was a food prep kitchen, you know, several thousand square feet being flood tested, okay? I have seen a 16,000 square foot commercial food prep kitchen in the Aria, the Aria Hotel Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, was flood test. Imagine 16,000 square feet that was managed and prepped for a flood test. All right, slope to drain. Quick question, is slope to drain a recommendation or a requirement? It's a requirement. Again, it's an ANSI standard. Hard to believe. Um, I do another presentation that's called, do I really have to do that? Do I really have to do that? Yes, you have to slope to drain. So um, I have a couple of examples here. Uh, a variety of manufacturers make prefab slope to drains. This is just showing you the typical quarter inch per foot, okay? Quarter inch per foot. Uh, these prefab slopes are made out of XPS foam, EPS foam, molded EPS foam, uh, and they're made with good old fashioned dry pack mortar, okay? But Hard to believe the lively art of effective slope to drain is getting hard to come by. So you're seeing a lot of manufacturers and a lot of contractors using uh, prefabricated slope to drains. Uh, I do have an article coming out in Tile Letter next month. It examines the whole phenomena of prefabricated trays and pans being made of XPS, EPS, you know, uh, styrofoam. I'd recommend, it's gonna be in title letter, take a look at it because it examines some of the, the challenges and results of this new approach to slope to drain. Now, live, this is from the forensic files, folks. This is from Las Vegas, Nevada. By the way, I brought, some, I brought my own marble. I almost lost my marbles, literally trying to find this place. And I, I, I bought the world's biggest stainless steel ball. I'll show you what that's about in a few minutes. But, a forensic expert, inspector, will oftentimes go into a shower pan and with marbles or with uh, ball bearings, just he'll release those, those round spherical objects and find out where they land. Now look at this, folks. This is the curb. This is the curb detail. It should be rolling towards the drain, okay? So obviously, hard to believe, 
someone who was paid money with a dry pack mortar bed sloped it away from the drain towards the curb. That's crazy. A couple other thoughts on um, slope to drain. It is a quarter inch per foot, okay? Um, typically, uh, if, if a contractor is doing it the old school method, dry pack mortar, they'll use something like a level or screed sticks to find their high spot and then ramp down to the drain. Um, but again, if you're going to use a prefabricated tray, let me show you some of the concerns. Most of the foam trays out there are made with three pound EPS foam. That's this right here, okay? See the steel ball right here? I'm going to drop it. Can everyone see this little indentation right here? Why is that a concern? If you're going to use these products and you're going to use a product that has a three pound foam, it's prone to point loading, compression, other trades damaging it. If you're going to use it, I mean literally tens of thousands have been installed successfully, but you have to use care to make sure you don't get this kind of point loading compression. Some manufacturers will put an additional uh, honeycombed matrix on top of it to give you additional strength and rigidity. For example, same as you can see, no dent. Other manufacturers will use fiberglass and mortar to achieve a, a denser skin. So just be aware there are a lot of options out there with regard to these prefab tra trays and pans. Okay, going back to not the place to cut corners. This is the third area of failure in shower pans, okay? And uh, almost every manufacturer now makes prefabricated outside, inside corners. Here you see an example of some prefabricated inside corners, prefabricated outside corners. And uh, this is this area right here where the curb meets the shower door frame is the number one failure point because what happens is if you don't waterproof that area, when you turn that shower on and you close that door, water's gonna migrate down into that area. Of course, and water seeks its own level, if there's no protection right here, it's gonna get down beneath the curb assembly, eventually swell. Uh, it's kind of heartbreaking, I was on a job in Denver Beautiful stone installation, perfect. The waterproofing was done really well, except for one thing, they decided to save a couple bucks and they didn't use curb corners, okay? Uh, I'd recommend, it's cheap insurance, and when you use them, realize they go on the inside and the out. You have to trim them out here sometimes, but they go on both sides of the curb, okay? So. Ask yourself, 20 bucks for some curb corners versus, I mean, low end. Low end shower remediation is two grand. Probably much higher if you're using expensive, you know, designer porcelain or natural stone. All right, part of the failure points is the lively art of wrapping a curb with lath and mud. Do we all know what we're talking about? You have a curb core, uh, can be two by fours, can be concrete. The contractor then forms lath, which by the way, they usually form the lath over the membrane. The lath is already razor sharp. And then they attach the lath with nails or staples through the membrane, which punctures the membrane. My point is, a variety of manufacturers now make prefab curb overlays, solid curbs. Why? Because it eliminates this as a failure point uh, for your installation. It also greatly standardizes the size, the height, the width, the length of your curb. And in terms of labor, these takes, take minutes to install, as opposed to having to form the curb, mud the curb, then let the mud dry. If you haven't used prefab curbs, you might want to take a look at that, okay? Here's what you don't want, okay? And by the way, have you ever walked into someone's home or, a, or walked into a hotel and seeing this little staining by the curb. That little staining, well, what that means is there's been a failure at the curb assembly. Water has filled up to the extent where it's now being forced out of the system. And uh, of course, when they pulled this curb apart, uh, 
You can see the, the pan liner had, 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 had been greatly damaged. It looks like they did a combination of a liquid membrane and a, a sheet membrane. It's kind of a, a comedy of errors. But you can avoid this by using prefab curbs and overlays, OK? All right, mixing product warranties. Uh, you know, in the brief time I tried to be a tile contractor, I realized very quickly I was better off selling it than setting it. Um, We've all, we all know that in the field, sometimes you have to get creative. You have to work with the products at hand. You're trying to save money. When it comes to waterproofing, please don't mix manufacturer warranties. For example, what I see oftentimes, uh, uh, a contractor or architect will specify a high dollar CPE sheet membrane for the shower pan, but then they're trying to save money on the walls. Okay? And they'll use an inexpensive liquid membrane. Now, there's nothing wrong with that liquid membrane. Well, there may be a couple things wrong. Number one, if that liquid membrane is not made by the same manufacturer as a sheet membrane, you're going to have a warranty issue. Number two, um, and, it, and by the way, you might want to take a look at this article right here because it really points it out. One of the big failure points in the last several years has become permeation, vapor migration. Uh, what they found is with the way we build houses, the way we build hotels, the way we build buildings, it's very efficient now, okay? And uh, so what happens when you have people taking long showers, especially on vacation, mom takes a shower, dad takes a shower, the kids take a shower, the wrinkled clothes take a shower. Vapor migration, if your membrane on the wall cannot withstand that assault of vapor in that assembly, vapor will migrate back to the stud wall cavities. You're gonna have microbial growth, which is a fancy term for mold. But the point is, when you start mixing and max, blending different products, different manufacturers, look, there are some wall membranes that can handle vapor migration. Guess what? There are some wall membranes that can't. So when you start mixing and matching, you get into trouble, OK? And why, what's the big motivation most times? Money. And we get it. Yeah, we're trying to save money. But again, one of the biggest failures I, I've ever seen in Las Vegas, Nevada, tens of millions of dollars was because somebody wanted to save money on their waterproofing system. One of the end results was microbial growth, vapor transmission, vapor migration into hundreds of upscale four-star hotel rooms. They all had to be gutted and rebuilt, so please be careful. All right, so let me ask you, this image right here, does anyone see anything wrong Let's pretend you're the contractor, you're the installer, and you've been told, please go ahead and apply the waterproof membrane and start installing tile. How many people, are there any people here who would do, would do that based on what they see right here? What do you, is that, can anyone see what's wrong right here? No? Okay, well, this is drywall mud. Okay? I can't tell how many jobs I've been on where, you know, the guy doing the drywall, the green board, and the rest of the project gets handed the contractor putting up the cement backer board in the showers or steam rooms. And so what's a drywall going to use for a drywall guy to use for his seams? Going to use drywall mud, right? The problem is, and what was worse about this, this is actually a steam room. And if you saw the amount of drywall mud on the lid, it would frighten you. Now, it doesn't matter membrane, no membrane, liquid membrane, sheet membrane. You install over this drywall mud, that is not an approved substrate. And you're going to have a failure. So failing to prep surface is deadly sin number three. And uh, you know when we had the recent, hopefully we're out of that finally, the Great Recession Depression, uh, we saw a lot of people cutting corners on floor prep. We saw a lot of people, it became like this hop, no, you're involved, no, you have to. I didn't, I didn't bid the floor prep. And uh, again, in my brief, I'm talking about brief excursions to being a tile setter, tile contractor, the one thing I was taught was floor prep is critical. I, I, I would just, I would never believe how many times could you foxtail broom and scrape and wash and prep. But you know, I was taught that, you know, it's a lot cheaper to do that on the front side, they come back and have incredible failures, bonding issues, because you didn't prep that surface, OK? Another example of uh, 
If you were to put a waterproof membrane, whether it were liquid or sheet, what are your challenges here? Well, if you've got a liquid membrane and you're supposed to have consistent 20 mil coverage, make sure you have your mill gauge, okay? Um, but all these low spots, all these voids, the liquid membrane's gonna puddle. And all the high spots right here, it's gonna be thin. And so you're, right away, you're leaving yourself open to a potential failure and warranty issue because you didn't put the membrane on per the correct mill thickness, okay? So floor prep is deadly sin number three. Disregarding prod, product limitations. Again, um, and I keep pointing to my, my, by the way, if you have trouble sleeping tonight, grab these articles. You'll be out in a matter of minutes. So it's better than any sleep aid you can find. But this is on exterior deck membranes. And what have I seen? This is a classic, classic. Mr. Contractor, Mr. Architect, Mr. Specification Writer, or Ms. Architect, Ms. Contractor, Ms. Specification Writer. They have, they have a certain membrane they love. This membrane works great on all their projects, and so they drag it outside for their exterior deck details. And guess what? 99 out of 100 of those products are not approved for primary waterproofing over occupied space. Okay? And I always find it puzzling that some of these manufacturers put it in really, really tiny print. You think they would be in like big uppercase underline triplicate. Do not use this outside for primary waterproofing over occupied space. You know, here's a good analogy. You've got a slow, steady, strong plow horse. You've got a thoroughbred race horse. You'd never ask a plow horse to run the Kentucky Derby, would you? Of course not. And you wouldn't ask a thoroughbred stallion to start plowing your fields. They weren't designed for that purpose. So, I mean, I know it sounds simple, but products are designed to be used, used in the way they're designed to be used. You don't want results like this, okay? Obviously, someone's waterproof membrane did not work out too well on their exterior deck. Same thing comes to steam rooms. We've seen a lot of steam room failures. A lot of membranes out there that work great in your shower, work great uh, at other types of residential applications, will not hold up to a commercial steam room. Look at your perm ratings, ASTM E96 Procedure E. Make sure your product for your steam room meets that level of performance. The number one, we're gonna close with the number one deadly sin. It's so obvious, it's embarrassing. Following the instructions. I kid you not, follow, I mean, I know our company, we include instructions with everything we send out. Most manufacturers have the instructions on the side of their bag, in their, on the side of their bucket, and on top of that you have smartphones, tablets, websites, tech lines. There's no excuse for not having success, but you have to follow the instructions. And I can, if, look, and guys are really guilty of this, you know, how many of us guys have put together a bike at Christmas or their kids' toys? and your wife's saying, did you read the instructions, honey? Okay, so you gotta follow the instructions. We're about to wrap things up here. Thank you very much. Uh, we are gonna be down, what's our booth number again? I just got here, it's, come on, come on, help me out. Great. <laughs> we're at a booth somewhere here. <laughs> come see us, uh, we're in uh, hall number C, uh, and we'd love to stop by and have you stop by and talk with us, but otherwise, have a great day, be safe, and God bless you. Thank you.